Welcome to the Susan Murphy Milano Show. Come on, have a red bow day. Hi, this is Judy Collins from Judy's House of Oldies, and you're listening to Hear Women Talk Radio on the Zeus Radio Network. The next hour of the Susan Murphy Milano Show begins right now. We are back for the second hour, where each week we bring you the lives of those interrupted because of abduction, suspicious deaths, homicide. Joining us is Monica Kaysan, founder of the Q Center for Missing Persons. The next case that we're bringing you is Melanie Matheny. Um, her mother, Debbie Daniels, is joining us. Melanie vanished from Bell, West Virginia on July 19, 2006. She was 22 years old, mother of three children. She was last seen approximately 8 a.m. after dropping her children off at a daycare in the vicinity of the 3000 block of East DuPont Avenue in Bell, West Virginia. Her vehicle, described as a gold 1998 Chevy Ventura minivan, was later located abandoned in the vicinity of Wyoming Street and Burring Avenue in Charleston, West Virginia. Welcome both, and welcome so much. Thank you, Debbie, for joining us on, on your daughter's case. Oh, thank you, Susan, for having me. You know, you know when you, you didn't live very close to her, she, you were, how far away were you when you got the news that your, your daughter was missing? I live a good eight-hour drive from the Charleston area. I live in Fredericksburg. And was Virginia. somebody there that day as they would always, making sure the children are picked up at school or daycare? Um. Yes, she would normally um, pick them up like clockwork. Um, this day, she um, did not pick them up when it was time for the daycare to close. So, she, so um, the other grandmother was contacted to come and pick them up. How quickly after you learned that that your daughter was was nowhere to be found was a missing persons port, uh, report completed? Um, it was made, I believe, that um, evening. Okay. Um, but it wasn't followed up till the next day, I believe. All right. And, and then how long after all this did they find the, the car? Um, Melanie disappeared that on a Wednesday, and the, the van was found the following Sunday. What, did, did, they, did the police tow it into the, the, the lot for, and then do uh, you know, check for prints and things? Um, yes, they did. Um, um, there were a lot of items found in the vehicle, but the odd thing about the vehicle is that there were no fingerprints whatsoever that's in the vehicle, not even Melanie's. Blood, anything? <clears throat> Nothing. So it looked like it had suggested that it had been wiped clean? Correct. And, and how old were the children at the time? Oh, they were young, two, three, and five wow. at the time. And, and she was, she was gonna, her dream was to become a nurse, wasn't it? Yes. She was actually uh, supposedly that day on her way to uh, check on her transcripts at the college. So here's a mom. She's putting her life together. Uh, but she has maybe some questionable people in her life as far as relationships and, you know, where she's got issues with them. And do you, does she disclose those to you? Does she share that with you? Um, yes. The, um, the boyfriend prior to the one she was with at the time she disappeared, he was extremely jealous. Of the children um, or of her? Of her. Um, I mean, it was it was over the top jealous. Um, I seen it firsthand. Um, she called me one time and asked me to come and help her, and I came and I stayed probably a couple months, and I witnessed it firsthand um, how jealous he was. Would he hurt her? Um, I'd never seen that. Part. Was it an angry, well, like, you know, it. you better do what I say, the stairs, the controlling, you know, more? No, it's pretty much just a, a, a um, mental control. Um, he would um, take her her fuses out of her vehicle so she couldn't go anywhere. He would, uh, he would just close her off from everything. Was this person the last known person to have seen her? No. Okay, so, so she disappears, but he's not living in the house. No, this is the boyfriend prior to the one she was with. Okay. The one she was with, w- what about him? Have police looked at him? Um, of course. Um, he has taken a couple lie detector tests. Um, he's been questioned many times. The last lie detector test that he was asked to give, he did not give because um, for lawyer recommended not to do it. Well, that's, that's common. The lawyers lure it up. Mm-hmm. Um, 
how soon after Monica? You, you know what? I've never asked you this, Monica. When when there's a case like this that presents itself and you get a call, how quickly should a family start to contact the Q Center and and start to to facilitate paperwork with your your agency? Well, we would hope it always would be instantly that, you know, they, they seek out after they make the police report that they seek out for some kind of help and direction in the case. Um, but many times what happens is families spend, you know, the first couple months or whatever spinning around and trying to get answers their self. Um, they reach, you know, they rely heavily on, on what people are saying in the community and what police are doing. Um, then there comes the desperation where they start to reach out and say, there's got to be some other kind of help. We don't know what we're doing. You know, you feel like you're spinning in a bowl. And, um, and, and unfortunately, a lot of times that's when families, um, you know, find us or hear about us through other families of missing people or even sometimes media or law enforcement will say, look, you know, here's, here's an organization that can help you long term. So, you know, and that's just as important. We try not to look at when we get involved, but when we do get involved, how things are conducted from there. And I can tell you that Melanie has had a lot of good officers that are in her corner, and they are working this uh, case, you know, constantly, and they do take things seriously. Um, And, you know, she, she does have good support there. But, of course, there's always more things that can be done or, you know, times you get frustrated, um... But it's, it's just one of those cases that's been very difficult that, you know, West Virginia, the area that she got missing, is nothing but mountain area. And uh, so it's like finding a needle in a haystack or trying to get information. It's not like the city where you can go door to door and things of that sort. I mean, literally, there's not much there. Well, she drops um, her child off, her children off at daycare. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. Is the area rural? It becomes rural. And, and so it it's anybody's guess what happens there. Does she have a cell phone? Yes, she does. And normally on that day, she would uh, be immediately on her cell phone because where she lived, she didn't have cell service. So usually as soon as she hit cell service, she would be on the cell phone immediately calling people. But this particular day, she didn't do that, which was odd. Do we know for a fact, did somebody at the daycare center see her drop off the kids? Um, yes, we do. She, she actually signed in that morning. Okay, so she signs in. The kids are dropped off. She takes. Was there a possibility of someone else being in the back of that van? Um, there's always that possibility. Um, we, two years after the fact, that she, after she disappeared, uh, we found out um, someone had seen her at 7-Eleven, and we didn't find that out until two years later. That same day, and you mean, when she went missing? Yes, exactly, right before she dropped off the kids, and we could have had possibly a video um, tape of her, what she was wearing, was anyone with her, um, anything like that, just acting out of the ordinary, but nobody came forward. What about cash, credit cards? Um, wh- what about activity on the cell phone after? Were you able to, to were police able to get that? Um, yes, they were. She made two calls that morning. Um, they bounced off of two different towers. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, were they areas made. that she would normally travel to? Um, not normally, um, but they were possibly on the way to where they were, where her boyfriend worked. It was in general, that general area, um, I believe. Also, where her current possibly, boyfriend worked. Correct. And you still had the other person who she wasn't seeing anymore. Who Was he still giving her trouble, do you think? Um, yes and, yes and no. Um, he... he he's always been jealous of her, even after they split up. But he knew she was seeing somebody else. Yes. And sometimes what happens in these cases is that person, and, and maybe the person that's being victimized doesn't say anything, but the, you know they're, they're kind of scared. And, and what they do is in the new relationship is they go to the person they're seeing because they don't want anybody else to know or there's no alarm bells going off. And, they'll, and they feel like that the person that they're with currently is going to protect them. So they really don't tell anybody about it. Mm-hmm. So did, did the current boyfriend make mention of the fact that she was in fear or there was a problem with the person that she had broken off the relationship with? No. 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 Mm-mm. So they didn't have any incidents within that time frame with the, no. with the old boyfriend? What about documents? No. Did, 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 was there child support paid to the children? I know that the, there was different fathers involved here. I don't believe at that time any child support was being made at the time. She had just split up with her prior boyfriend a few months prior. Was that, so was that really prior boyfriend one of the children's father? Yes. He was the two youngest father. He was the two youngest. Mm-hmm. And, and now he has custody of the kids. Correct. And are you able to see those kids? 
Um, very rarely. I haven't seen them for a year. Um, I um, have a, uh, It's my fault and also their fault. Um, I have been really stressed, and it, just seeing the kids just sends me over the top stress-wise. That's and, understandable. Um, what about Melanie? What about her girlfriends? Have, you, have they been interviewed? Have people come to you? Called you, sent you an email and condolence, or, or said, "I can help. Can I put up posters?" Have, have, has there been that support out there for you? Um, not really. Being so far away, it's hard to keep the word out. Um, my ex mother in law, she tries to keep it the word out there, but she is just so um, drawn down by this. Her health is really much suffering, and um, she's getting a very negative attitude lately is very um, negative. So this is a very difficult case, Monica, because you know you wouldn't know what belongings and things were taken, would you? You wouldn't know. You know, was there any signs, perhaps, back at the <clears throat> house after she disappears that that things are I, missing? Not that I'm aware of, and I mean they've been pretty forthcoming as far as a lot in the information. Um, and uh, the the one thing that just alarms me is is the the wiping down of the vehicle because obviously with the children and her and being in the vehicle that morning and not a fingerprint a, a sticky fingerprint even at that you so of of having children in a vehicle that that's disturbing and you wonder where that took place because that had to take time it, gum wrappers um, you know um, you know yeah. all these things we're going to come right back we are talking with the mother of Melanie Matheny who's been missing since 2006 and Monica Kason from the Q Sounder stay right with us please and now Susan Murphy Milano proves there's more to her reputation than a keen mind and big hair the Susan Murphy Milano show welcome to another hour hi this is Michelle with LaBellamy Vineyard you're listening to hear women talk radio on the Zeus radio network hello race fans this is Jeff Gilder creator of racersreunion.com when you're in Myrtle Beach check out my favorite the Caravel Resort the Caravel Resort has a golf department and concierge with golf privileges at virtually every course on the Grand Strand including the coveted Dunes Club and ladies pamper yourself with Caravel's studio spa Featuring services such as Swedish massage, heated stone therapy, reflexology, manicures, pedicures, facials, and more. Awaken your senses with the most requested massage and spa therapies. The Caravel Resort, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, 800-507-9145. Get the best rate on the Grand Strand when you use promo code RACERS at thecaravel.com. 800-507-9145. What's that on your computer? Nothing. I know he's having an affair. I just can't prove it. She gets weird phone calls all the time. I wonder who she's talking to. Do you know what your spouse is doing on his computer or her cell phone? If you want to know, do what the private eyes do. Talk to Steve Abrams of AbramsForensics.com. Steve is an expert in computer and cell phone forensics and a highly regarded attorney. He's the private eye go-to guy, and he's your guy, too. So if you want to know what your spouse or anyone is doing on their computers or cell phones, talk to Steve at AbramsForensics.com. That's AbramsForensics.com. Or just click on the Abrams Forensics banner ad on Hear Women Talk. And for a free 15-minute consultation, use promo code Zeus. Hi, this is Jessica Dorvaj, host of the Where Is My Guru show, and you are listening to Hear Women Talk Radio. And now, once again, here she is, Susan Murphy Milano. Delilah and I are back with Monica Kaysan, founder of the Q Center for Missing Persons, and we've been talking with uh, Debbie Daniels, mother of Melanie Matheny, who vanished from Bell, West Virginia, on July 19, 2006. She's a mother of three. She was last seen approximately 8 a.m. after dropping her children off at a daycare in the vicinity of the 3000 block of East DuPont Avenue in Bell, West Virginia. Her vehicle was described as a gold 1998 Chevy Ventura minivan. It was later located abandoned in the vicinity of Washington, Wyoming Street. I'm sorry. You know, you. It, this is very difficult to keep these cases up and out. And, and Debbie, you have done billboards. You have really done, you know, you've got a beautiful website. 
you are really keeping your daughter's case alive, and 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 you're working very hard at it. Yes, I'm trying. It's very hard. Um, I I heard something this past summer that really shocked me. I never heard it this way. Is that you're um, you're actually um, b- trying to sell a product. Your loved one is your product, and you're trying to keep it interesting and out there. And it's just sad to hear it that way. But you're comp- competing with everything else on the TV. It, you well, know, in this case, hasn't received a lot of national attention at all, has it? Yes, no, we haven't had hardly any attention. And you have a, you know, you have a different type of a situation here. You're not there. She's somewhere else. Um, there's also the, you know, you, just by what we're covering today, you know, a lot of times I can see the pattern of conduct in cases. And, and frankly, I'm going to have to go in and really look at this or, or have Monica's help on it, I'm, which is more than likely, because there's so many things here that throw you off. And I, and I think, Monica, when you were brought in, I'm sure that, that made this for a very challenging case, because what's the area like out there? Um, it's it's industrial mixed with uh, coal mining type uh, scenery. Um, a lot of coal mining uh, going on out that way. Um, high mountains, you know, you're actually driving through the mountains, which are, you know, thousands of foot drops on one side and thousands of foot, you know, going high on the other side, kind of thing. Um, you know, businesses scattered, you know, that are off of a very busy um, mountain road. That's you know, you kind of flying through the mountain and. And uh, it's just, it's it's a hard, it's, like I said, you can't get out on the street and, and really talk to a lot of people because there really is no street. It's like a lot of roads going everywhere. And, um, but, you know, and then when the family is so far away, it makes it very difficult. But she does have some family members there that have, you know, remained very active. Um, and, and it just, you know, when time passes and, and, you know, we wish they all could get, a full week of coverage when they first become missing because that's where, you know, the nation needs to know every missing person, which is, I, I know that's a, a big grasp out there and probably hard to even achieve, but we give so many hours to one case on national media to where you could fill probably a hundred, you know, of cases to get the word out. And I think that's vital and that's something we as advocates are working on daily, pressuring, you know, media sources like they're all important. You can't just pick and choose you know, who you want to air and, and that type of thing. Um, but then, like she said, you know, your your child becomes this product that at, when a certain amount of time goes by in a missing person case, you have to sell them. You're competing against other missing person cases. You're competing against people that are missing even within your own community that come up after your person. Um, and, and it's all this networking that you have to really, you know, treat it almost as a, as a, as a business because you have to start, you know, meeting other families and getting, helping them and getting them involved in your case and you get involved in theirs and hoping that a, a front page story might come out of these two families bonding together or, you know, I know, um, Debbie travels to a national conference every year and she also goes to a retreat in Nebraska with Project Jason and so, you know, um, at our conference, you know, she networks and, and gains more support as well as the other things she attends. Um, you know, we put up the billboard. You know, you're doing posters. She's participated a couple years in our national road tour. Um, you know, and even other families have, have come in through our center by that way as well. So it's like, you know, you're constantly doing balloon launches, candlelight vigils, you know, doing all these things just to make an event so the media will come and, and, and just even cover it and try to hear some of these stories. And after a while... It's hard to even get them to do that because it's like, okay, how many balloon launches or candlelight vigils or releasing the doves or putting up a billboard? How many times can you do that? So you're constantly having to market and think of, oh, here's a new website like we did for her or here's a new, you know, that type of thing, constantly trying to change up the story to get somebody to tell somebody out there that she's still missing. And, and even in the shows and things that we do, it's a lot of work to put this together yeah. every couple hours. I, I could do it every day, but the cases that I work, like you work, you can't do it because, you know, the living, the dead, hurry up, back and forth. People don't realize what goes into every single hour of every day when somebody goes yeah. missing. And it's not just this case. I mean, you we decide when we can and when we, we decide when we look at these cases 
And and sometimes because you're very busy or I'm very busy, we both trust each other to say which way we're going to go. We wish we could put everyone out of them on because they all deserve the attention and they all deserve to go further than what they're not. And that's what's so important about this case that until you brought it to my attention, I didn't know about it. And the one, yeah, exactly. And the one thing that um, you know our organization works hard on is to try to have equal time for equal you know for every case and and but of course if a case moves up and you've got a new tip and it, and it's huge um you've got to run with it which you might have not had activity in that case in the past eight months or even eight years you know and so sometimes a cold case can jump up and become the one that has to work on immediately because this is huge you know and then sometimes you're in the middle of a case that is constantly moving so you have to juggle you know other cases in it and um it's just so sad. There's never going to be another, enough help out there to help all of these no. families. But whatever little bit we can do, whether you're a volunteer in a community, a business owner, an organization, or whomever you are, you know, step up, try to give, take a little bit of relief. Because these families are living a uh, hell each and every day without the knowledge and the, of knowing the unknown fate of their missing loved one. And that is the most damaging long-term thing of stress any family can endure and that's what people don't understand. It's not like they know what happened. They can't deal with anything until they get the facts and what is exactly going on. So they stay in this limbo. I always say it's like a a funeral procession every day that just keeps going around the same corner, you know, and it never stops, and you just keep stopping to watch it. And, you know, in and, and, and Melanie's case in particular, um, you know, her family is devastated by this. They have to struggle each day to get out of bed and to move on. Um, and it doesn't, you know, with time, sometimes I think we learn to understand it better and come to a common ground. But some families, in time, is the worst thing, and it just continues to wear on them. So it is even more of a struggle. Um, and my heart goes out to, to not only this family, but so many. And I know that Debbie has had a lot of support and done a lot of things, and she'll continue on until some kind of resolution happens here. And I do believe that this case will be solved. Um, you know, like I said, she definitely has one struggle that she doesn't have to deal with, which she does have good law enforcement who are open to do anything and everything and work towards trying to bring Melanie home. And another important thing about this show, and, and we've seen it time and time again, is you can always take comfort in knowing that the person that knows information or who has killed or abducted is listening right now or on the after broadcast on a podcast. They, they're downloading it. Because each time when we put up a show, each time when we put it's up a day, it has been amazing. The emails, the tips that we get, the information, people do come forward. And, you know, it's it's a jolt when you see it come up on Google or like like you would see a Melanie Matheny or, a, or you know, in, in well, any of Well, it's interesting cases. because we, you know, we track what we write about. And to look into the stat counter and see certain hits coming on to certain cases – it, it give, usually it means there's some movement, there's something going on, and sometimes there isn't, and, and it makes you wonder why are they hitting on it. Well, it's not really us that track it; it's it's more the you know the, the homeland people, but you know it. it well, w- that too. Yeah. But it's it's also the fact that we can we know from the guests that come on through to mm-hmm. the station, we know. Um, and we hear things. So sometimes, because we all know, and Monica, you know this best. People can't hold secrets in, and they tell yeah. someone. And maybe the person that knows the information on Melanie's case, maybe she's in a relationship with the person who had something to do with Melanie's disappearance. Maybe she. And, and Debbie, we have had these conversations, and, and you can talk about, you know, what what your struggles have been, and and maybe some more personal things um, about Melanie. But you know, it's definitely, uh, you know, this is her child. It's not something that's going to go away. It's like an open wound, and um, we are going to keep continue to fight the fight until you know and be there with her long term um but you know it's it's vital debbie tell people some of the things that maybe they can do to help their loved one and some of the things maybe that you've learned um to deal with it from day to day right i mean that's exactly what it is it's a wound and it's a wound that just barely heals over before Um, the scab is ripped off every tip and every rumor we get that scab is ripped off and every time it's ripped off it gets deeper and deeper and it'll heal over barely but then it it eventually gets ripped off with the sensitive skin under it but um, the main thing I can tell people is just be honest with their law enforcement you gotta have a relationship with your law enforcement if you don't if if they don't trust you 
they're not going to be able to work your your loved one's case as they need to. Um, I tell my law enforcement everything. I don't care how sensitive it is, how personal, I, I tell them. And I've gained a relationship that way. They tell me just about everything. And I deal day to day by just accepting what's given me that day and moving on. Because the information, when it comes, when, when Melanie's found, it will, it will be out there, and that's when I will deal with the situation. But until then, I just go day by day and just taking each tip, each what can the What can the average person out there do for you, Debbie? Um, you know, we've got a lot of listeners that aren't familiar with the missing persons um, issue and, and what mm-hmm. you go through and what you've just explained. Um, what well, the best thing that people can do for me and any other missing person is just get the word out there. That's the hardest thing for us to do is just spread the word that um, Melanie's still missing. It, it's, it's, it's hard. As I said, we're, we're uh, marketing our product and we're competing, like as Monica said, with every other missing person, every other um, um, news article that's on. Um, it's just so hard and just little things, support, um, just a uh, say your, say a prayer, um, but mainly is helping us helping us get the word out, spreading the word. Is and I do have something. I do have something to interject there. Um, I had a man who was taking a vacation in Nevada a couple of days ago, and he went and downloaded all the Nevada um, cases that the Q Center had and printed out posters. And him and his wife had called to let us know that they were making a pledge that every rest stop and gas station or wherever they stopped, they were going to post these five women um, in this particular area because that, that's where they were actually, their destination was, and they were going to be traveling all through Nevada. And so I thought that was really a good idea that they mm-hmm. took that upon themselves to say, you know, we're going to take a trip, but we're going to actually do something, and we're going to let these people know we're going to try to help them. And then that, just that little gesture kind of, made me smile and I was like that's that's really a good idea you know so it kind of gave me another idea of like you know thinking about another way we can help promote you know in the summertime let's do a campaign you know and start doing you know hey summer vacation help help people you know because you're stopping at rest areas and camping places and things of that sort get these people's poster out there get their information out there and for the investigating agency if anybody has any information the sheriff's number is 304 304- Three five seven zero one six nine, or contact the Q Center. That's a twenty four hour tip line. The number is nine one zero two three two one six eight seven. Let's bring Melanie Matheny home. Thank you so much, and we'll be right back with Monica Q. More from the um, 